Welcome to Sunday evening Bible study. We're in the book of Acts tonight. We have extensively studied in the book of John, the Gospel of John. And John supposedly was written after Acts. And Acts deals with times before John was written. And Acts attempts to describe and to answer problems that had arisen, arisen for the early church before John was written. And so we're into the book called the Acts of the Apostles. And you might say that this is in one form a letter to Theophilus from Luke. Actually it's a writing we don't call it an epistle, we call it a book or a gospel or a, or a church history. There's a lot of things you could call it. It has to do with the spread of the gospel by the early church. I, uh, tonight I will spend most of, I will spend most of the time we're together tonight talking to you about what are called introductory matters so that you can understand what this book is about and where it came from and why it was written and why it talks like it talks and tells what it tells. The who, what, when, where, why, and how, you might say, is tonight's subject. And I would tend to call this Instead of the Acts of the Apostles, uh, if I'd have named it, I'd have called it the growth of the early church. And Jesus told them that you'll be my disciples. And then he told them where, and he started in Jerusalem. And that's exactly where the book starts. And so I've, I've entitled this class, First in Jerusalem, even though we're not, the, not into the text very much yet. I, if I'm able to cover enough ground, we'll get into some of the text, but very little, because I have done a study on the historical background, and not just the background when Acts was written, but how things worked out over time. And the first thing I'll talk about is the author of Acts. Now, why do I need to talk about that? Well, of course, it's an interesting subject to know who wrote all these books. But this one was one of those that was unsigned by the author. And so the question arises, do we have it right? Uh, we, uh, you, you've heard a rumor that uh, Luke wrote this, but uh, there is no copy of Acts that's ancient that has his name on it as the author. And so I'm going to go into that. And so the first point here is, for, for the last 1,800 years and more, I've got 1,800 plus years, the Christian churches have accepted that Luke did write it. And so you've got to ask, well, how can you say that in the, uh, after you know that his name's not on it? Well, here's a discussion of it. In the first place in church history, we know that Irenaeus and Tertullian and the Muratorian Canon of 1750, or no, 175 AD, going back that far with those people, and that that's accounts for the 1800 plus years, those people who are who were the early church fathers said that Luke wrote it. And that's not the only ones, I just named them. And they also quoted Luke and Acts as being from Luke. And Luke didn't put his name on Luke either. It's just to Theophilus. So, the ancient scholars, and they were Oh, they were good scholars. They were smart, and they were well-educated. And these scholars were very concerned that 
the whoever wrote these would be qualified. And of course, the first qualification they came up with is uh, that the, maybe the apostles wrote them all. And I call it apostolic authority. The apostles are the ones that Jesus personally chose from the beginning. And Luke tells you that he checked with those who were with Jesus and eyewitnesses of the word from the beginning. That's the way he introduces Luke, and I'll read you some of it. But they were very concerned that the, whoever wrote these books and, include, and got included in the New Testament you have in your hand, which technically is called the canon, the list, the approved list or the accepted. The approved is a wrong word. It's the accepted list of New Testament valid scripture. And they were concerned about what went into that list and what did not. And they are some of the authorities, the authorities that made the list. And so how did Luke get in there like this? In two books. Because he definitely was not an apostle and ever claimed to be. Nobody's ever said that Luke was an apostle. And the fact of the matter is he was not even a disciple or a follower of a person that they considered an apostle. The Apostle Paul claimed to be an apostle because of his experience on the Damascus Road. He said that the Lord appointed him. But they weren't there and they didn't know it and they weren't witnesses of it. And it took a long time for Paul to be accepted as an apostle. And even at that, he wasn't accepted as, a, as one of the originals. He was accepted as the apostle to the Gentiles, if you'll remember. And so Luke might, you might say that they would never choose Luke, even if he wrote it, but they did. Well, Luke only appears in the writings of the New Testament on three occasions. That's all. So he's not a big player in the program. And his name never appears in the book of Acts with all those others. Paul named Luke as a fellow worker and a physician, but it, that wasn't in Acts. And Luke, being a follower of Paul, did not have apostolic prestige nor status to make his case that he wrote these books. It had to come from somewhere else. So where did it come from? Well, these and I'll, I'll just make a statement here that's a statement of logic and fact. And that is that these ancient authorities, you see it number G, these ancient authorities probably would not have agreed that Luke, a Gentile, was the author unless they were quite sure that he actually did write it. The fact that Luke was so different from all the rest is evidence that he is the author. So the writer appears in Acts under the word we. And you all have heard about this, but there are sections in the book of Acts in the travels of Paul and the other missionaries that the word we is used instead of they. They went here or we went here. And there are three sections and I've named them there in chapter 16 and chapter 20 and in chapter 27 and 28. There's those three sections where he doesn't use the word they in describing action. He says we. And so you can know that whoever wrote this and of course, I believe it was Acts, and the church believes that, I mean, did I, did I say Acts? We believe it's Luke, and that he was there. Modern scholarship agrees that Luke and Acts by the, were by the same writer. You just can hardly deny that there was two different writers of these books. They are connected. Luke's gospel and Acts not only 
is astounding that he was admitted as the author, but it's astounding that a Gentile wrote over a fourth, more nearly a third of the New Testament that you have. I mean, all of the Bible except what Luke wrote was written by the Jews and really for the Jews. And then here's this Gentile alone that has written as much of it as he has. This is astounding if you get to thinking about it. It may have been that these books were known in the beginning as Luke's book one and Luke's book two as they were presented with no title. And they were presented with one book and then a second book. And you can read it in there. I'm going to do it. So we're in volume two of Luke's gospel, you might say. And they called it the Acts of the Apostles. Well, I'm going to get into how that happened. And I'm telling you that it was addressed to a Theophilus. And that's an interesting question. What was he talking about when he when he called that name? Because it has more implications than just the name of one person. Well, the author didn't give his name, so we don't we can't prove that, that Luke wrote it, but we think he did. We don't know exactly when he did. There's a debate about that, and I'll try to cover it, give you some information about the date. He didn't give it a title. And so the question arises, well, how did it get a title? I'll tell you. But the author did explain the purpose of his writing if you read it. You will understand the purpose not only from the introduction, but there is this movement of the missionary work of the church from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Y'all ever heard that phrase used before? Check Matthew 28, 19, and 20, the Great Commission. You'll see it. Well, Luke followed that in the growth of the early church. So the writing, well, we don't have an original copy of it. And so the question arises, how many copies are there? And are they all alike? And if they're not all alike, then which one of them is correct? Well, I can tell you that when something spreads all over in various churches and it's made out of sheepskin or papyrus, within a few decades it's going to decay into powder or trash. And so they had to spend time. You had scribes who did nothing but copy the scriptures so that they could preserve it. Now, do you think, do you think that they could copy the whole Bible in Greek without making any mistakes? Well, there's a record of that. And so what do we know about that? Well, that's a whole course to be taken in a seminary about how to work, how to work your way through the mistakes. But I can tell you that going to the moon was a small project compared to to what's gone into straightening out the text of the Bible. I mean, mankind has spent a lot of time and money and effort making sure that what we have is valid. It's a miracle what we've got. And I'll get into that a little bit. So, the original writing was accepted and therefore preserved for us as inspired by God. And that's why mankind has spent so much time and effort and money and whatever it takes, whatever it takes, mankind has spent it preserving the integrity of these writings. And you're going to see it here. And I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to suggest to you that what you have here I've got my Bible, my modern New Testament in, under my hand here, and we regard that as inspired, just like the original copy was. And it's that good. That's important. 
So, do you understand that we can trust what we got is what I'm telling you. And I'm going to give you some more information about that. There are people who attack the Bible because of the mistakes that were made. Well, we admit them. On the other hand, we found them out and we straightened them out. So, you have these two books that we call Luke and Acts. Now, Luke ends the first book with Jesus being taken up into heaven. You all remember that? That's the end of Luke. And then the second book, Acts, starts right there with Jesus being taken up into heaven. That's one of the proofs that this second book is a continuation of the first. And so I'll read you the last verses of Luke and the first verses of Acts. The last verses of Luke, starting with chapter 24, verse 50. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. There's some words you can see in the second down there. When they were then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. All right, now Luke begins this way. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day, now there's that phrase again, he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Now you can't unravel that connection. It's there. Luke connected it. So, he has introduced his writings carefully. And so I'll read you the introduction to book one. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. And I could give a whole class on that, and I have to y'all in the past, if you'll remember, I brought this up. So now, the introduction to book two. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. You can't untie the connection both as they begin and as they connect. Now, is this print too small for y'all to read? I might ought to split it up into two, but I got to typing real crazy and I filled the page up, and so I'll try to do this quick. So, I've got the first note up there, the Acts of the Apostles. And so I've got a question mark on the date it was written. It was written sometime around 60 or which 80? Y'all want to take a vote or do you care? Well, there's people that care. The question is, the way it was written, do we decide that when Luke, uh, when Luke wrote that, he didn't know anything about the, des the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. Notice that 60 and 80. 70 is right square in the middle of that. And there are those that say, oh, he had to write it before the destruction of the temple because he didn't tell about it. And then there are those that say, hey, wait a minute. You haven't read the fine print. And he had Jesus predicting it in detail how it was going to happen. 
And the reason he knew that it was so is because it was written after it happened and he knew that Jesus had it right. And so those people say it was written about 80 A.D. Do you see the difference? Well, we're not going to solve it. I just told you the problem. Y'all, if y'all want to vote it out, when I come back, y'all can tell me what you decide. First question. How did the Jewish followers of the Jewish Messiah, and that is what we know as the early church, who started in Jerusalem. Now, I'm emphasizing that they were Jews, and they started out in Jerusalem, and they were following the Jewish Messiah. How do you explain that that thing, the early church, came to be an overwhelmingly non-Jewish, Gentile, Greek and Roman worldwide movement? How do you do that? Well, the answer is read Acts and you'll see. I mean, this, this, it's just almost not credible to say that this happened like this, that they started off, Jesus, Paul said the gospel was to the Jew first and then for the Gentile. Well, that's exactly the way it was. And, and Luke in Acts tells you how it happened. So the question, how did the Jewish followers change? Well, here's the answer. You see number two. The message from Acts is this. That the message of Christ was sent first to the Jews, but then to the Gentiles because as a whole the Jews rejected it. Have you all seen that in the Gospels? How it was rejected? Well, Luke and Acts is telling you what came of that. So the next question, number three, why are most of the speeches and sermons in Acts directed toward the Jews? Y'all ever think about that one? Even the one on Pentecost was directed to the Jews. So what is the, what is the explanation for that? This was a Gentile uh, church, and everything that, that we know that they said was what to the Jews? Well, the an here's the answer, number four. The church made a defense and a challenge to the Jews concerning the legitimacy of the claims of Jesus Christ. And they did this in the public places, in their synagogues, and at their temple. This came to be known as apologetics, by the way, over time. It's not an apology. It's an explanation and it is a claim on them. The church claimed that you people have thrown away what was your gift. That's how those speeches and sermons and teachings went to the Jews first. So, the next question. How was it, how did the Roman authorities become involved in settling the disputes among the Jews, between the church and the synagogue. How in the world did Rome get itself involved in that when they didn't care a hoot about what went on in the church or the synagogue as long as it was peaceful? And what I just said explains how they got involved. It was not peaceful. The message from Acts. Christians, starting as Jews, and loyal participants in the synagogues found themselves being expelled amid charges brought by the Jews. These Jews, in making a defense of, of the Jewish laws, their laws, were using Roman law to defeat the church. They couldn't defeat the church arguing from their own law. The church could defeat them. So they... They, uh, I'm, I'll just say that they were accused of cheating. They took it to the Romans, and they had some laws that were different. The church, as a part of the Jewish religion, had legal protection. You see where I am? Uh, you see my cursor in the middle of the page? As a new religion, they could not have legal status. 
they became illegal. If the synagogue could throw them out and let the Romans know it, then the Romans would say, uh-oh, that's a new religion and you can't do that. The officials had no interest in the Jewish disputes. That's why they couldn't convict Paul in a lot of things. They turned him loose. Their focus was on civic peace and order. That's all they were interested in. And you have one Roman official after another that heard the gospel trying to make peace. As a matter of fact, when they turned to the Romans and made the complaints, that spread the gospel to the Romans. Do y'all do y'all understand that when they when they tried to defeat the church by going to the Romans, all they did was spread the gospel to the Roman officials. They the, the officials realized that the disturbance was just in the synagogue over Jewish laws, and so they didn't care. And only much later did the officials find a reason to persecute Christians. And that really came down from Rome, not from the synagogues. So there's a historical note, and I've tried to tell this before. I don't, y'all don't remember everything I say. Uh, I don't understand why you can't, but you don't. <laughs> I've never had a class where everybody could remember everything I said. So I have to learn that just because I said it doesn't mean anybody remembered it. But maybe y'all will remember I explained to you that when Julius Caesar invaded Egypt in 47 BC, he almost got beaten. There's this incident where where the Egyptian troops chased Caesar and his troops off the beach at Alexandria, and Caesar swam out to his ship to save his hide. Now you you might well know that Julius Caesar was a man. I mean, he could do it. And he, that's one reason he was never defeated is because he just was almost undefeatable. But he had to swim out to that ship. But he came back, and they had another day. And when that other day came, you had a thing called the Battle of the Nile in 47 B.C., and Caesar won that battle. And one reason that he won it is because he called in his allies, and part of the ones that came as his allies were the Jews led by Antipater, or uh, the, the correct Greek is Antipater, which means the ancient father. I don't really know exactly how he got that, but I do know that this man, Antipater, is Herod's father, and because Herod had him for a father, he wound up being king of the Jews, crowned by the Romans, not by the Jews. Do you all get the connection I just gave you? In 47 B.C., Herod's daddy and head of the Jewish troops saved Julius Caesar, and Julius Caesar rewarded him and the Jews by saying that we, you, your religion and your people are under the protection of Rome, and your, your religion is protected by Roman law. Now, the church, when the church was kicked out of the synagogue, they lost that protection. You remember when Paul was charged by the synagogue with all these things. Paul, at the now this is at, no, this is at the temple where this happened. And Paul said, no, I'm not a Greek. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. What was he talking about? He's saying that we are not lawless that we are under that law that Caesar gave us and we are protected just like you are. Well, they managed to say, no, you're not. And you and it was politics then. Or the who are the authorities gonna go with? The ones that are ruling the Jews and can make a, a riot? Or are we gonna go with this little bunch over here that's Christian? Well, you can see how that would go. The church did not choose, you see the last one down in number eight? The church did not choose the above circumstances, but suffered them and reacted to them. The reaction of the early church became the outreach and the explanation for it becoming a worldwide religious movement that changed the world with the gospel. 
the world turned upside down. How did they do it? Well, if you'd have left it to the Jerusalem church, they would have spent the rest of their life trying to perfect the Jews in Jerusalem, and that wasn't going to happen. The Lord helped them get out of there with all this foolishness. And they won. The church won. So in Acts, you have this title, the Acts of the Apostles. Well, how did it get that? Well, I'm going to tell you. This is one version of it, and there's not much of anything else, so this is it. It was called Acts in the, in, in, uh, the oldest copy of the New Testament that exists. That's, uh, I put a Greek letter up there. The, the, uh, in literature, if you see a quotation from this codex or Bible, it'll have that olive letter on it rather than all that about Codex Sinaiticus, so and so, so and so. It's just all of it. And the name of the book in Codex, uh, Codex Sinaiticus is, you see that Greek letter, that Greek word up there? I mean, I tell you, that doesn't make sense to anybody. <laughs> but <laughs> it spells out the word praxis, from which we get the word practice. And so they derive the word acts from the word praxis, which means the things you do or the things that got done or the activities. And so they took that word and changed it into the acts of the apostles. Now, how do I know all that? Well, I'll give you some more information. I've got down here in the first point that, it, that it's unknown if, if the author of Acts put a name on the book. And I'd say that we know that he didn't because it's not there. Nobody has come forward with it. But tradition has called it the Acts of the Apostles since Irenaeus. That really pronounced, whenever you see an A-E like that in Latin, that's not A-E, that's I. So it's Irenaeus. And he lived uh, approximately 200 A.D. I'll give you a better date in a minute. But since 200 A.D., the time of Irenaeus, we've called it the Acts of the Apostles. Not before that anybody can prove or know, but knows about. He and tradition call it the Acts of the Apostles. Well, is it? Well, I'll just point out some things. Number three, the 11 remaining apostles are listed in Acts only one time. And that's in chapter 1, verse 12. And I'm going to read it to you. This is the only time that the apostles enter into this story. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, Simon, and Judas. Judas, the son of James. I just read you the first names of them. But you all understand that that's the only time that that list is given in, a, in Acts. And there are three other apostles in there that do have some prominence in Acts, and you all know who they are. It's Peter, James, and John. I mean, you have Peter and John at the Pentecost sermon and so forth. But the main focus of the book of Acts, and we all know this, that it's on Saul of Tarsus, or Paul, the apostles of the Gentiles. So, Barnabas plays as big a part as anybody in there except Paul and nobody claims that Barnabas is an apostle and then there's Luke who's the author of this and he certainly never claimed to be an apostle so is it the acts of the apostle or is it the acts of the church well 
Take a look at the bottom of that list right there. Modern scholars say it ought to have been called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's about right. And I've also told you that I think it might ought to have been called the growth of the early church because the mystery is, is how did this Jewish bunch take the world as Gentiles? And the answer is the early church grew into it and the Holy Spirit led it. So, who is this Irenaeus? Well, he's the Bishop of Leon. Or really, it was, you see number one up there? He was born in 130 A.D. in Smyrna. Well, that is, it's now Izmir, Turkey. And he died in 202 at Lugdunum in Gaul, where he was the bishop. It was later changed to Lyon, France, in modern times. Well, not modern times, but early times. He was a student of Polycarp. Well, who is that? Well, Polycarp is said to have been a student of John the Apostle. In other words, the second generation from the Apostles. And so that means that Irenaeus was the third generation from the Apostles before 200 A.D. Y'all got that? And so here are some things about him. He wrote, you know, I, I gave you some classes on the heresies and the philosophies and the philosophers and the Gnostics. Well, this man was one of the first scholars that took them on. And he wrote this writing, an important writing that stands today in, in certain pieces and forms. And he wrote a thing called Against Heresies. And it was an early book of the teachings of the Gnostics. And we, and, and we, we have trouble finding all of these old books, but that's one we got something of. And so here are the claims attributed to him. He was the first that we know of to claim or call the book of Acts the Acts of the Apostles. And I kind of believe and do say that they were so conscious of saying that these writings are from the Apostles and all these Gnostic writings, you can't listen to them. They're not from the Apostles. They were so conscious of that that they had to say that this was the Acts of the Apostles even though it's not by an Apostle. So he was also the first to advocate the use of only four Gospels. Do you remember I read you in Luke where he said many have written these things? But I'm going to write one that I've investigated it from the beginning with those who were there. All right. This man, Irenaeus, is one of the first to pick up on that and say we ought to only use four Gospels, one of them by Luke. The first to advocate the Church of Rome as the oldest authority. If you want to know the roots of the Catholic Church, that statement right there is one of the roots of how the Catholic Church came to dominate all the other churches for hundreds and hundreds of years. He was the first to advocate the naming of Luke as the author of Acts, and he even quoted him in Acts chapter 3, verse 14. And in his writings against the heresies, he, he made this statement that you might find interesting. The Ebionites used Matthew's gospel, and really me meant they misuse it. And Marcion mutilates Luke's. And the Docetists used Mark's, and the Valentinians used John. Well, I won't go into all those details. I will tell you about Marcion on Luke. Luke was the only Gentile written gospel. And Marcion said that since the Jews rejected Jesus, we need to reject all Jewish scripture, including what Matthew, Mark, and John wrote. And so he said Luke is the only valid gospel. That's what, Mar that's what he meant about Marcion mutilates Luke. He didn't misquote it. He just misused it. So, some of the earliest writings quoting from the New Testament came from Irenaeus. 
he quoted 21 books out of the 27 that we now have. Do you all understand that that is early in the history of the New Testament? Those books were out there by the, I don't know how many to tell you, hundreds. And it came down to 27. And he quoted 23 of them before the year 200. Do you all get what I just told you? This is, this is early stuff. So what is this about, I told you about Aulus, Codex Sinaiticus. What is that about naming the book of Acts in the text? Well, you see up there at the top of the page, I've got it spelled out what the, what the name is. And this copy, a codex, I'll define what a codex is. A codex is a handwritten book on square pages like we have in our modern books, but it's handwritten. Remember, they didn't have a printing press till the 16th century or so. Is that about right? 15th anyway. I think the 16th is right. So all these are handwritten, everything we got. So what in the world is the Codex Sinaiticus, or some people call it the Sinai Bible, and it was probably written in the 4th century. Now, I didn't mean to say it was written, I should have said it was hand copy in handwriting. And I'm going to show you some pictures of it. But in 335 A.D., Constantine, the one who called the council, the first council, his mother came to the Holy Land and tried to find all the holy sites. And how she got down 300 miles in the Sinai Desert looking for something, I don't know what she did, but they say she did. And she found this spot of the burning bush, as she said. And so they eventually built St. Catherine's Monastery down there to commemorate the spot of the burning bush. And Mount Sinai is just right over there, you can see it. So that's how the thing got there, and that's how long, starting in 335, they actually built St. Catherine's in the 6th century. But in 1731, you had this naturalist roaming around down there in the desert, 300 miles from nowhere, Vitaliano Donati. Does it sound like an Italian to y'all? So he's a naturalist down there and he was admitted to the monastery. And he came back and reported that in there he had seen an ancient Bible on large square parchment that was written in very fine and large script. Now he didn't report that this is one of the oldest Bibles in the world. He didn't say anything like that. He was just astounded to find such a book down there in the middle of nowhere. Well, in 1844, a German biblical scholar, Constantine Tischendorf, decided, he heard about that and decided, you know, I'm, I'm going to go down there and see what that is. And so King Frederick Augustus the second of Saxony paid for an expedition to him to go down there in 1844. And he found the book. And I'll just add a little story that I heard about it. And that is that when he walked in the room where the scribe was, that was the custodian of the little, uh, it's not a little library, it's one of the biggest scripture libraries in the world down there, they say. It's, I think. I read somewhere that it's the second biggest depository of the ancient scriptures after the Vatican. Anyway, they got it. So when he walked in the room with the guy that was in charge of that, it was cold. And he was taking leaves out of this old scripture and putting it in the fire and burning them for heat. 
If one of those leaves today would probably be worth a million bucks or more. Anyway, Tischendorf had to explain to this. I mean, you're talking about a bunch of monks that live down there isolated from the world, 300 miles from nowhere in the desert. And they, and they don't know the value of things. They don't, they don't know. They don't have any money. They don't care about money. They don't care about nothing. They're just serving the Lord, copying the scriptures and preserving them in the library. And so they had no idea that what they had was a treasury. And so Tischendorf talked them out of 129 leaves or pages. And I'm going to show you the pictures of it. And took it out of there. And all that caused... A sensation what are you talking about when the Bible scholars got a hold of that they were just astounded and so he went back in 1859 and this time the Tsar of Russia sponsored the trip and so he got out of there that time with 347 leaves and of course he had to sign a contract with them and all that kind of stuff but it went as and finally wound up as a gift to the Tsar of Russia well, in 1933, the Tsar of Russia had been displaced by who? The communists, the Soviets. And so the head man was Joseph Stalin, and they were fighting a war between the Reds and the Whites. Now, y'all didn't know that the, our troops and the British troops fought in that thing. It was kind of a secret. One of my great uncles froze his feet in the trenches in Russia fighting that war right there. And Stalin needed money. So the British found out that he wanted money and they brought it up about the parchment, the book, the codex, and he offered to sell it for a hundred thousand pounds. Now a pound is not the same as a dollar. That's millions of today's money. But anyway, the deal was made and the Soviets sold that to the British, and they've got it today. And so here's the present situation of the text. And this is one of the most, there's only four of these codexes of this quality that we've got in the world. And this is one of the oldest, if not the oldest. And so from Genesis to First Chronicles, it's gone. It's unknown that we'll ever find it. It might be some of that stuff that that fellow was burning in that fire. We don't know. It's gone. The surviving part of the Septuagint, oh, you mean the Septuagint was in there? Yes, sir. It was in the Bible then. And the surviving part of the Septuagint is Second Estrus, Tobit, Judith, First and fourth Maccabees, not number two and number three, they're gone. First and fourth Maccabees, Wisdom, and Sirach. These are the books from the Septuagint that are still there. And the books of the New Testament in the Codex are the same as what you've got. And the order is only slightly different. I'm going to show you. And it also has two other books that are not in your Bible. Now, we have reconstructed the text over thousands of years into what you have now have. And so they go down there in the desert and find something that's 1,800 years old or thereabout. And it agrees with what we got. Y'all, What do y'all think of that? That's something. Anyway, that is where, in that thing, in that writing of Acts, and that's the only codex that's got a, the whole book of Acts in it. There's only that one. And that's where you get that name, Praxis, as the name of Acts. There is a picture of St. Catherine's Monastery, and the reason I chose to show you that picture is you see that little door right there? There's no gate to that thing, or there may be now, but there wasn't then. And if you got in that monastery, they had to haul you up through that little door right there with a rope. 
I mean, they weren't going to let anybody in there that wasn't authorized. Now, this thing was founded in 330 by, they say, by Helena, the mother of, of the Emperor Constantine, but it wasn't built till sometime in the middle of the 500s, the 6th century. Now, this is the oldest continuously habited Christian monastery in the world. When they built that thing, they moved in, and they've never moved out. There's always been inhabitants of that monastery from that day to this, and that's the only one in the world that's that old. And it commemorates Moses and the burning bush, and I just thought I'd show you here how far that thing is from any place. It's 316 miles from Jerusalem. It's 275 miles from Cairo, where Pharaoh was. And it's 262 miles from Beersheba. I mean, you're talking about in the middle of nowhere, literally. Now think about these guys going down there. Way back yonder, two or three hundred years ago, like I told you, hunting scriptures. Well, there's the burning bush that they show you today that's a picture from the monastery as a matter of fact that picture is on the state of Israel tourist promotion thing they want you to come see that and inside that scroungy looking place is that church that's the church of the transfiguration do you think that they live in poverty quite down there? I mean, look at that. Well, here's a, a little bit of the information. I told you there were four. Actually, there's more. There's a bunch of them. But, but none of them rank with these four. And they finally admitted Bizai, the last one down there. And it's not near the quality of them, but it's in the, it's in the main ones. And so the first one is all of that's the first letter of the Greek alphabet codex Sinaiticus and they say and there's a debate about this because the ones that have got the one in the Vatican called Vaticanus they say that's the oldest so there's this argument I put the Sinaiticus is the oldest just out of meanness but anyway the <laughs> Sinaiticus is in the British Library in London and then there's Alexandrin, Alexandrinus. And that one was written in the 5th century sometime in the 400s. And that one also was in the British Library. And since they found that one, there's a lot of modern scholars that think that that's the most superior copy of the Greek New Testament that we have. There's less controversy about mistakes and so forth. And some of the modern translations are using that one as over against the others. And I, I can give you a list of that another night if you get interested. But there's Sinaiticus, Alexand Alexandrinus, Vaticanus, and Ephraimi Rescriptus, which is in France. And that Bibliothèque Nationale de France means, I think, the French, li French National Library in Paris. And then this Bizai that's also been admitted, which was printed or written about 600, that's at Cambridge. So you can see that the British have been on the ball about preserving these things. You gotta hand it to them, they've, they've, they've done it. So I call your attention at the bottom of this page to what I call a parallel date. Do you see those two oldest codexes there that are in the early 4th century? You see them? Look down at the bottom, and that coincides with the Council of Nicaea. Well, remember that the Council of Nicaea was called by the Emperor Constantine, who was the first emperor to grant toleration to the Christians who up till that time had been declared an illegal new religion. You remember how that happened? When they got kicked out of the synagogue and separated from the synagogue, they were illegal, subject to arrest, persecution, and so forth. And Constantine had a vision. 
You remember we've talked about this. His army came to the Milvian Bridge outside of Rome and the other army was in, in Rome. And he had this vision under this, under this flag or symbol or whatever. Conquer. That was the word. Conquer. And so the next morning his soldiers were ordered to put on their what we would call an X and a P. Well, that's not an X and a P. That's a chi, the letter chi, for the beginning two letters of Christ. And that P is not a P, it's a row. And so that's C-H-R of the word Christ. And so that's one of, I've told you this before, but that's the symbol of Christianity that Constantine won as the, and became the emperor of Rome under that symbol. And so he called a council of the bishops of all the churches in the empire. And he put what's called the post at their disposal. There was this transportation that Rome, they built all those roads and they used it. And they had messengers going up and down that road. And they had carriages going up and down that road. And Constantine made that available to the bishops of the churches and told them, you can come and I'll pay you way. And so each one of them, you see down there the next to last line, each bishop could bring two priests. That's interesting that the early church had one bishop and multiple priests and three deacons. And so you had this hundreds, even thousands showed up at this council at Nicaea, which is not far from Constantinople in Turkey. And it's the first time that that had ever happened in church history. What a day. And so what did they do? Did they decide on the New Testament? Well, I can tell you that they swapped stories and, and they asked each other, what are y'all, what books are y'all using? What books are you using? And they made notes about that. That is somehow the New Testament came together. And they agreed that they had to fight heresy. And so here's the proof. Here's what the official actions of that council were. The first thing they put out is the Nicene Creed. And I'll show you what that is. But this was a statement to defeat Arianism, which was a form of Gnosticism. Now, you remember all that time I spent explaining about the Gnostics and the philosophers. Well, Arius was a preacher and a bishop and a priest, all of that, who said that Christ was begotten of God all of a sudden, and that's how he became a man. And that meant that he was not eternal, didn't he? Well, you remember the time that John spent telling you that Jesus was what God was. In the beginning was God. Remember all that? John said that. And so this council said it also. So that's the first thing. And I'm going to show you a copy of the creed here in a minute. But they came up with that to fight the Gnostics. And then they settled when we're going to celebrate Easter. Now the eastern part of the Mediterranean has always been a little bit different from the western. You even have it today. The Roman Catholic Church is the western church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, mainly in Russia and out east, they've, all, they, they've always been a little different. And at that time, the Eastern Church was using Jewish time or the time that they suffered, they, they did Pentecostal, they did Easter. And the Roman Church said, we're not gonna do it the Jewish way, we're gonna do it our way. And so the, this council said, we're gonna do Easter the Roman way. And everybody said, well, okay, we'll do it. So they settled on Easter. <laughs> Y'all got any questions about what they settled on? There's a picture of uh, Constantine, all we have. That statue is in England, in York. And he happened to have been with the Roman army in York when the old emperor died and his troops said, we're going to make you the emperor. And so he was proclaimed the emperor of Rome in York. 
The problem he had was that there were two others out there that also had armies that he had to defeat. And that's what that is. You see that symbol right there? That's Cairo. That's the sign that he was given in a dream as a battle standard. By this sign, conquer. And he used it, and he did. And my version of the story is that all this in, that Luke put in Acts about all those Roman officials that Paul gave the gospel to and others, it says that some of them believe Jesus. There's, there's Roman officials that believe Jesus. And I say that when he put that thing on his shield, the guys over on there on the other side they were ready to fight him, realized that they were going to be fighting Christians, and a lot of them were Christians. So it didn't go too good for their side. That's my story. This picture, I'm not picture, but this statue kind of has a uh, the face of a philosopher there instead of a warrior, wouldn't you say? Take a look at the difference and the one that came out of the Roman Empire here. That's, that's the British made, I guess it is. And that's the ancient statue from, from the Romans. Does that look more like a warrior to you down there? Well, he's wearing the uniform there, but he's got the face of a general there. That's him. So here's the Nicene Creed. I told you I was going to tell you about it. Now, to make it simple, if you want to understand the simple part of this, this part, this paragraph up here deals with one God. This part down here deals with the Lord Jesus. You all see it? And this part over here deals with the Holy Spirit, who's also the Lord, from, from the Lord. So you've got one God in three persons. They decided that at the first council. Well, of course, it was in the scriptures that they had to go with. But there were these disputes that had been going on for how many years? How many years did the church have to fight the Gnostics and the philosophers to adopt a statement like that to say that they were all wrong, that we believe this? And I will tell you, that we Baptists have rejected one of the ideas behind this thing here. And that is, this creed got to be a thing where if you couldn't say this, you couldn't be saved. And the Baptists have never said that. Does the scripture ever say that if you don't believe the Nicene Creed, you can't be saved? Does the scripture ever say that? It does not. And so we don't buy it. You go into some churches in Little Rock next Sunday and you'll hear them say this right here word for word every Sunday. There's one of them not too far from here. They're good churches. But they do what Baptists won't do. That's a, that's a pretty good statement. I don't, I'm not going to fight it at all and this is not a class on that. You can look that up if you anybody wants to be a scholar you can look it up. This is a picture of one of the pages out of that Bible. That's what it looks like. I mean, you wouldn't think that a thing like that would be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, even millions, would you? That's one of the most valuable sheets of paper. It's not even paper, it's parchment, which is animal skin. But that's one of the most valuable sheets of handwriting in the world. There's another picture of it closer where you, can you see the Greek there? And can you see how carefully that's all handwriting? That's not a printing press. There's one. Can you see that any better? Well, it's hard to see. But here's a leaf from Esther, and that's got all the discoloration out of there. But do you all see how good that handwriting is? And I'm going to close with this slide right here, and we'll take this up next week. 
But here is the list of the New Testament that's in that Bible that's all that old that they had already decided what was what. And there's, there's two main differences in the order and there's two main differences down at the end. You see the epistle of Barnabas and the shepherd of Hermas. Those are writings that were not accepted as inspired in the New Testament. They're not in the modern Bible. This is an argument that they ought to be there, but they're not. The second change is, let's start here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, what? Where's Acts? You see Acts over here? Acts is after Philemon. We put it over here. But what comes after Philemon in our Bible? Look up there. It's Hebrews. So they took Acts out of this place and put it in here. And they took Hebrews out and put it after Philemon. And that's our New Testament. You can check that out. It's the same as ours except for what I showed you. Now we are over time. But I will answer your questions if you raise them, if I can. Let us pray. We thank you, our Father, for this time that you gave us. And we pray that we will be able to use it and that you will use us through it. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen.